Hello everyone, how's it going? My name is Dan the Tutor. Today we're going to look at a famous problem in physics to electricity and magnetism. It is about the electric field of an infinitely long sheet of metal. So let's say hypothetically I have an infinitely large sheet of metal. Now it doesn't actually have to be infinitely long, it just has to be really big compared to the size of an atom, which is really small. So in other words, this example works even for something the size as, let's say, a penny. Because compared to an atom, a penny is like the size of the solar system. So I'm drawing the front view here. This is an infinitely long sheet of metal with some charge Q on it. And now I'm going to draw a side view of this situation because it's hard to draw what I want to show unless I draw a side view. The side view is going to literally just look like a straight line because it's a flat sheet of metal. So it's like when I have my hand here and I turn my hand sideways, it looks flat. And what I want to do is I want to find the electric field at two points, point L here and point R here. I want to find the electric field at those two points. So once again, since I want to find the electric field of a three-dimensional object, I'm going to use Gauss's law, our favorite. Now what Gauss's law says is the electric flux is equal to the charge enclosed divided by epsilon naught, where flux is equal to electric field times A, the area. And normally there's a cosine theta in that equation, but as long as you choose the right shape, you can ignore the cosine theta. And what's going to be the right shape for this example? Well, I'm just going to tell you it's going to be a cylinder. So here is my Gaussian surface in three dimensions. It's going through my sheet of charge. I know it's hard to visualize that, but maybe you'll see it in the side view, what I'm doing here. Remember that my Gaussian surface is an imaginary surface that I make up specifically to use Gauss's law. And the reason why this is the right shape is because if you think about what's going on here, electric fields always point away from positive charges and towards negative charges. If this plate has charge, positive Q, and it wants to go outward, well then the electric field lines, it wouldn't make sense to draw them on the front view. I'll draw them on the side view they're going to look something like this. And so as you can see, my electric field lines are going perfectly through the faces of my cylinder. These two faces right here, the electric field lines are going perfectly through them and they're not going through the sides of my cylinder, which means I can ignore that for Gauss's law. Again, I only need to worry about my two faces. Actually, I wanna change something. It doesn't make sense to have an infinite plate of charge with charge Q. Instead, I'm going to say it has surface charge density sigma. So now let me quick explain what surface charge density is. So first of all, we use the Greek letter sigma. It's one of the toughest shapes to draw. It looks kind of like an O with a tail at the end. And that's going to equal your charge over your area. And since my area is infinite, then it means I must also have an infinite charge, but they're proportional to each other in some way. Don't think about it too much. Just know that I gave you surface charge density sigma. And so now if I want to use Gauss's law, the good news is that I can find the electric field at points L and R at the exact same time. And the reason why is because the flux is going through both of those faces of my cylinder at the exact same time. So what I'm saying is when I set up Gauss's law, E times A equals charge enclosed over epsilon naught. Electric field is what I'm solving for. The area is the total area of my Gaussian surface. So in other words, I'm looking at the two faces of my cylinder, both of which have areas of pi r squared. And since I made up the Gaussian surface, I can say that r, the radius, is whatever I want. I'm going to choose just lowercase r because we typically leave it as variables in this class. It will cancel, so it doesn't matter anyway. So in other words, when I say my area, it's gonna be pi r squared plus pi r squared. So that's two pi r squared. And then that will be equal to the charge enclosed. Now let me just draw my shape one more time. Again, this is the side view. If I have my cylinder here, then the charge enclosed is going to be the charge right inside the middle region here, which again is a circle, pi r squared. And the way I'm actually going to find my charge is by writing the equation for surface charge density. Sigma equals charge over area. I'm saying Q is my Q enclosed that I'm solving for. So I just need to multiply both sides by the area. 
So that means charge enclosed is equal to sigma times my area, which I just said is pi r squared. And that's what I'm going to write in the numerator, sigma pi r squared divided by epsilon naught. Now to solve this, all I need to do is divide both sides by two pi r squared. And when I do that, I'll get a final answer of E equals sigma times pi r squared divided by epsilon naught times two pi r squared. And it looks like the pi and the r squared will both cancel and the electric field will be equal to sigma over two epsilon naught. And there is our equation for the electric field at points L and R. And this has some pretty cool implications. What I mean is that if I go back to my picture, I'll just redraw it. If I look back at my side view, that means if I have this point here, point one, and this point here, point two, and this point here, three, and this point here, four, it means the electric field at all of those points is going to be the same. Why is that? Because where in my equation do you see the distance away? There is no variable. So that means the electric field must be the same everywhere. Again, this has to be an infinite plate of charge in order for this to work. But this is very cool. And it doesn't matter if you're on the left side or the right side. It's going to be this electric field everywhere. And since this is such a famous example in physics e &M, I'm going to tell you, I think you should memorize this. Now, of course, you can derive it because I'm sure you love using Gauss's law to derive stuff, right? Yeah, no, you don't. So I'm just telling you, I think you should memorize this. It'll make your life a lot easier. And that's pretty much it. So thank you all for watching today. My name is Dan the Tutor, and I'll see you in the next video. Take care, and bye-bye.